Welcome to the Just Ingredients Podcast. I'm Cara Lynn, and here we talk all things nourishing to the mind, body, and soul. This is a place where you can find just good ingredients to life. When thinking about your journey towards better health, do you think about water? It's no secret. We know how important it is to drink water, but we often forget to consider the quality and safety of the water we are drinking every day. Research shows that despite where you live, there is a high likelihood your tap water may not be as clean and safe as you think. Clearly Filtered is on a mission to help you and your family stay hydrated, healthy, and safe by providing the best filtered water products on the market today. Clearly Filtered makes insanely powerful water filters that completely blow the competitors out of the water. Clearly Filtered is independently tested and certified to remove over 272 harmful chemicals and toxins found in our drinking water today. They are easy to work with, family-owned, made in the USA, and passionate about trying to help provide us with clean and safe water every day. I love that Clearly Filtered is affordable compared to many other untested alternatives has portable filtered water products to take on the go, and helps you stay safe and hydrated everywhere. Clearly filtered products are also eco-friendly and can significantly reduce plastic and water waste through their patented filtered technology. Join the tens of thousands of new customers today who have joined Clearly Filtered in the quest for better health through clean and safe water. Go to clearlyfiltered.com and use the code JUSTINGREDIENTS to save 15% off your order today. Chris Wark is a young adult cancer survivor, best-selling author, and patient advocate. Chris was diagnosed with stage 3 colon cancer in 2003 at just 26 years old. After surgery, Chris made the decision to go against his doctor's advice, opted out of chemotherapy, and chose to use nutrition and natural therapies to heal. Six years later, in 2010, Chris began sharing his story of faith, courage, and determination and his message of hope that chronic diseases like cancer can be prevented and reversed with a radical transformation of diet and lifestyle. Welcome to the show, everyone. Today, I am really honored for the guests that we have today. Um, Like the bio said, it is Chris. I have read his books, followed him for years. He just has been an inspiration for me for years. When I actually got on my health journey Someone had recommended um, your book, listening to your story, things like that. And so Chris Beat Cancer is one of uh, the first books that I read years ago. I just have really looked up to you and admired you just for, you know, everything you stand for. And so I'm really excited for the followers, listeners to get to know your story, hear about what you um, believe in, things like that. And so welcome to the show today. Well, it's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Well, I really appreciate it. So I find your story fascinating. So what if we just start at the beginning and tell the listeners just a little bit about yourself, your background, and maybe your cancer story? Yeah. So I was diagnosed with stage three colon cancer when I was 26. And uh, I had been having abdominal pain for the better part of a year and kind of put it off and ignored it and hoping it would go away. And it didn't. And uh, eventually had a colonoscopy and they found a golf ball sized tumor in my colon. And I didn't even know what a colon was when I was 26. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, seriously. When you're in your no 20s, idea. you can uh, live forever. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought it was a punctuation mark. That was that was my medical uh, anatomical knowledge. So uh, after that diagnosis, which is obviously pretty scary, I mean, they biopsied the tumor and said, you have colon cancer. You know, when you get a diagnosis like that, I mean, your life just sort of grinds to a halt. Right. And it's terrifying because you're like, this, you know, am I going to die? When am I going to die? Am I going to suffer? Like, what is what is my life story going to be? What's going to happen to my family? You know, I was a newlywed. I'd been married for two years. And so I'm thinking about my wife and I'm an only child. I'm thinking about my parents, you know, like, yeah. and it's just, I mean, it's just a lot. It's just a really, really traumatic thing. And in fact, a lot of cancer patients experience PTSD symptoms right. just from the diagnosis. It's such a traumatic life event right. to be told that, you know, you have a life-threatening or potentially fatal disease. So I, I'm a Christian. And one of the first verses that came to mind after my diagnosis was Romans 8, 28, which says, and we know that God works all things for the good of those who love him. 
Hmm. and who are called according to his purpose. And I just thought, man, okay, if this is true, right? If I really believe this. The scripture. Yep. If I believe the Bible's true and it's God's word, and then uh, then this has to be true for me, that God is going to work this for my good. Wow. That gave me some hope, <laughs> but I still didn't really feel good about the situation. Right, right. right. I would rather not. In fact, I wasn't like, oh, goody, <laughs> you know? Right. <laughs> But that gave me some some comfort and some peace in the middle of this really scary situation. And so I was told I needed surgery, and uh, this was just a few days before Christmas, and they were trying to get me in the hospital right immediately, like tomorrow kind of thing. And I didn't want to be in the hospital over Christmas break, and you know, it was just too depressing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I postponed the surgery and went in on December 30th. And they took out a third of my large intestine, third of the colon, uh, it's where the cancer was obviously, and some lymph nodes that were also positive. It had spread to lymph nodes. And when I woke up, they said you're stage three C, which is worse than they initially thought they were, they were hoping I would be stage two. If you're stage two, they can just take the tumor out at least a different standard of care now than 2004. But in, in 2000, well, December, 2003, it was, if you're stage two, you have surgery and you go home, you're done. Stage three, you have surgery. And then nine to 12 months of chemotherapy. Wow, that's a lot of chemo. Yeah, and that's what I was told. And now, you know, they do things differently. Now they may try to give patients chemo before surgery. They just, it just depends on the doctor. But anyway, two things happened in the hospital that got me thinking a little bit differently about the medical process and the medical industry. And the first thing was the very first meal that they served me after cutting out a third of my large intestine, which was a sloppy joe. And, you know, nobody likes sloppy joes, right? <laughs> I've never met anyone or ever heard anyone go to a restaurant and say, I don't see this on the menu, but is there any way I could get a sloppy joe? That's so funny. True. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so it's just the worst cafeteria food, right? This is like what they serve at summer camp or in the military or if you're in prison, you know, <laughs> you're getting sloppy joes right. for lunch. And so that was kind of, that was a shocker. You know, I was like just gross. Like this is the worst food possible. Well, I have to chime in really quick because my husband just had a colonoscopy. And when I walked in afterwards, they said, you need to drink some liquids. And so he was drinking a cup and I asked him, what are you drinking? And he's like, well, I'm so thirsty. And all they handed me was Diet Coke. And I was like, <laughs> Diet Coke after a colonoscopy? How about some water? Anyways, go on with your story. Yeah, this is, this is just typical, right? Full disclosure, I ate the sloppy joe. Okay. Right. Well, you're I hungry. Ate. I was hungry. Exactly. I hadn't eaten in a couple of days. But I just thought, you know, why are they serving this horrible food to, to sick people? You know, it mm -hmm. just, I knew what healthy food was. I knew what health food looked like. I wasn't eating it. I preferred junk food, fast food, and, you know, processed food. <laughs> right. But uh, then the other thing that happened was this the, the day I was told I could go home, my surgeon stopped by our room to check on me. And we were just having a conversation about what's next. And I just happened to say, Hey, is there any food I need to avoid? Because in my mind, I was thinking, well, they just cut out a third of my large intestine. Everything you eat is going down the tube, right? right. Going yeah. through there. And I don't want to eat the wrong thing just in case, like right. whatever you do, don't eat hot sauce or your stitches will melt you know, or something. Right. And he said, no, just don't lift anything heavier than a beer. Wow. Eat whatever you want. Yeah. Any so it's kind of reinforcing this message. It doesn't matter what you eat. Wow, right? that's incredible. That, that was that was the, the the signal, the message I was getting from the hospital food they served me, and then my surgeon saying it doesn't matter. And I'm like, okay, that doesn't seem right. And that was all the advice I got. I went home and I was recovering from surgery and you know, I was weaning myself off the pain medication. Just was really within that first week, I was just didn't feel good on the pain meds and I was just and just wean myself off. And as I sober, sobered up, I started to think about my life and my future and, you know, what was to become of me. And I had seen advanced cancer patients out in the world. Right. And anytime you see someone in that state, especially the first time, I can remember the first time I saw an advanced cancer patient, like I was a little kid mm -hmm. and I saw a guy at church and I just was like, mom, like, what's wrong with that guy? Yeah. You know? And because it really, it, it, it 
makes an impression on you when you see another human in that just that's just been poisoned by chemotherapy for months and months on end or sometimes years right and i saw myself becoming that and that was a scary proposition i'm sure so i, I didn't have a good feeling about doing it for that reason right um i knew it was very toxic and it was poison and it made you sick and your hair falls out and you know all that so but I didn't know what else to do. And so I just prayed about it. My wife and I just prayed and I was like, God, you know, if there's another way besides chemotherapy, please show me. Mm. Right. I trust you. I, I, I trust you to supply all of my needs. And I just, just prayed this, this, just a simple prayer of, of faith, uh, and desperation and, and, um, just asking for help, you know, sometimes it just takes, you know, a, a, a really, huge problem that you don't have a solution to to humble you enough to really seek god and and to go deep in your faith and that did it, this did that for me for sure so true. two days later i got a book that was sent to me from a man in alaska and he was a friend of my dad's i'm in tennessee and that book was called god's way to ultimate health and it was written by george malcolmus who had colon cancer like 30 years prior and he healed with a raw food diet and juicing. Hmm. And so as I'm reading his story, I just, I mean, I just started crying. You know, I'm reading the book. I'm crying on the couch, you know, I just overcome with emotion because I knew it was an answer to prayer. Right. I just knew it. I was like, this Definitely. is it. Like, I asked for something. This showed up. Exactly. Like, this is what I need to, to know. And this is... And, and, you know, he was making the case that no one else had made that made so much sense to me, which was the reason that so many of us are sick with heart disease, cancers, autoimmune disease, so many of these chronic diseases, which we now know, I now know, are, are actually categorized as Western diseases, diseases of affluence. Um, the reason we have so many of these diseases is because of our diet and lifestyle choices. Right. Our choices have led us down the path of disease it doesn't happen overnight, but it happens over time. And for many people, it takes decades to develop chronic disease, but sometimes it gets people early, yep. you know, and teenagers or young adults or whatever. And um, I was obviously an early, uh, you know, young adult cancer patient, young adult, young adult colon cancer patient. So I got really excited about this completely different way of looking at my situation, which was, you're not a powerless victim of disease. You're not unlucky. That's not why you have cancer. And unfortunately, most cancer patients are told that by their doctor. Yeah, which right? is really say, well, how did I get cancer? Right? Why did I get cancer? Well, we don't know, but um, it may be uh, hereditary or genetic, or maybe you're just unlucky. Yep and just bad luck and that is so disempowering right because it takes a person and basically you're basically telling them there's nothing you did to contribute to your current situation and uh therefore there's nothing you can really do to help yourself except for show up for your next treatment yeah. right we are your only hope and we just want you to be comfortable so you just you don't change anything about your life. You go home, you eat your favorite foods, eat, eat more of them. You deserve more ice cream and pizza and donuts and burgers, right? Because this is a hard time for you. So you should really use food as medication, right? This is basically what cancer patients are told. Eat whatever you want and eat more because we don't want to want you to lose any weight mm -hmm. during chemo. And they send them home with like foods you should eat. And it says like milkshakes and pizza and ice cream and stuff like that. Wow. I mean, this is, this is real. This is right. happening all over the country every day. And so I was empowered and I realized the way I was living was killing me. And this was good news. Didn't make me feel bad about myself, right? right. I wasn't beating myself up or right. guilty or ashamed. I was just like, oh, really? Oh, well, if the way I'm li living is killing me, if I'm the way I'm living is contributing to my illness, maybe I can change what I'm doing, change the way I'm living, change what I'm eating, and I can contribute to my wellness. And so uh, I changed my diet overnight, which anyone can do. Yep. There's not a single person I've ever met that can't change what they're eating overnight. 
Right. Some things in life are hard to change and take time, like the way you think and the way you act, <laughs> right? And forgiving people, I, that's, that's harder and necessary. But changing what you eat, you can do literally between now and your next meal. Right. You can do it immediately. So, so that's what I did. I, I went to the grocery store. I bought a ton of uh, fruits and vegetables, all, all raw, all organic. And I just said, this is what I'm doing. I'm going all raw. Like this guy did it and his body healed. And I was excited about the prospect of just seeing what would happen. What would happen if I only ate fruits and vegetables, all raw, uncooked, unadulterated, straight from nature, right? Not contaminated with pesticides and herbicides and fungicides. Like this is the purest diet I can conceive of. And I want to see what happens. So I did that. I adopted that diet, bought a juicer, started juicing carrots and other, other veggies, beets and celery and cucumber and, you know, ginger and turmeric root, all that kind of good stuff. And I was on my way. I mean, just, I just decided I'm taking massive action and I'm going to change every aspect of my life in order to help myself get well. And so the diet was the first step. And once I did that, I realized, wow, I can do this. Uh, what else can I do? Right. Mm. So the changing your diet's like almost like a gateway drug <laughs> right. to self-empowerment. <laughs> Cause you realize like once you realize you can really control what you eat and you can feed your body in a way that's so much better than you have been you know, in your past, then you realize, okay, well, maybe I can I can start exercising. I should start do that. And so I started running. And then maybe I need to start changing my mindset more and really starting to catch myself thinking negatively and choose to think positively right? And stop being so critical and judgmental and address the people in my past and forgive the people in my past who had hurt me. So all of this was like this stepwise progression in my life of trying to, to get better, <laughs> become a better person and a healthier person, not just physically, but mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. So I was really excited about that, all the healing path. But in the meantime, I had all this pressure from family, people around me to do chemotherapy. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Because they were they were starting to hear, you know, right away they were starting to hear. Well, Chris is thinking not thinking about not doing chemotherapy. You know, he's not he's he's saying he may not do it, that kind of thing. So I'm getting phone calls from family members. You have to do chemo. You have to do what the doctor says. You you, you don't understand how urgent and important this is, and don't be stubborn. Right. You know, this kind of I'm, stuff. I'm sure. And you know, I know somebody who tried alternative therapies and they died. Don't you think if, if there was something better, the doctor would know about it? And I'm like, I, I don't know how to answer these questions. Right. I'm <laughs> sure know? I'm sure that like, was a little bit of uh, confusion, though. Did it, it make was you wonder? And, and... And it wasn't just confusion. It was like it really kind of pulled the rug out from under me in, in some ways because I thought these people around me, are they're supposed to support me, and they're all like against what I'm trying to do here. And they don't understand what I'm trying to do they think I've lost my mind or something. And it's like, no, I've never been more clear about what I need to do. I want to live and survive. And I want, and I need to change the way I'm living my life in order to help myself, my body. Did you know right away you didn't want to do chemo or was the peer pressure of all the family members or whoever, did that persuade you to think more about chemo? So initially I was like, I guess I'm going to do it. And then I was like, as I said, when I sobered up, then I was like, gosh, I really don't want to do this. And then I read the George's book and I was like, okay, now I, I really don't want to do it. Right. I want to build my body up. I don't want to tear it down further. Right. And that book, he's pretty, he is pretty adamant about, uh, against chemotherapy because he had, he had seen, you know, had personal experience with a number of people around him that went through chemo and suffered and, and died. And so he's not only making a case for nutrition, but he's making a case not to do conventional cancer treatment. So I, you know, and it was compelling for sure. So yeah, so that, that made me really think hard about it. But my family is like, please just go see the oncologist, just hear what they have to say. So I was like, okay. So we, we go to this appointment and uh, it didn't go well. It was, it was, you just feel like a number, yeah. you know, we go in this cancer clinic, the waiting room's packed. There's tons of people in there and you know, you're sitting there waiting for them to call your name. And the, the crazy thing was the TV was on while we're waiting and it was one of the morning shows. So so back then they would have TVs in the waiting room and they just put it on, you know, 
NBC or CBS or whatever, right? Some mm -hmm. TV channel. Now it's all pre-programmed. Oh, interesting. So now the TV is all, they have this loop and they just run this like cancer medical clinic programming oh, for you to watch. But it wasn't that back then. It was like the Today Show or Good Morning America or one of these shows. And out comes Jack LaLanne. Mm. He's the guest and he starts going off about nutrition and juicing and, and raw foods and fruits and vegetables. And he said, if man made it, don't eat it. Oh, interesting. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is happening right now with me sitting in this, you know, right. cancer clinic waiting room. Like another answer to prayer. It was a mini miracle for sure. It was, you know, like when you're, the analogy I like to use, and this is how my cancer journey was. It's like, if you've ever been hiking, uh, somewhere you've never been before on a new trail, there's always a moment during the hike where you're like, are we lost? Mm -hmm. For sure. You know what I mean? And, you know, but you stay on the trail and eventually you see a little marker, right? You see a little sign or a little marker or whatever. And you're like, okay, no, we're good. Yep. There's the yeah. marker. We'll just keep going this way. Well, that's how it was, right? There were these little, just constantly these little signposts along the way that were reminding me I was on the right path. Oh, that's right? amazing. And so that was, that was one of the first ones. And, um, but we go and see the oncologist and he was just very boilerplate, you know, gave me the kind of typical spiel. Hey, well, look, you got young adult colon cancer. It's very aggressive in young adults. You've got about a 60% chance of living five years with treatment, wow. blah, 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 you know? And it was just, it, it was not encouraging. It was just depressing. Yeah. And I happened to say, well, what about the raw food diet? He said, no, you can't do that. It'll fight the chemo. Oh, wow. Those are his words. That's what he said. Wow. And then I wish I had said, what do you mean? You know, but I didn't. Right. I was just kind of like, oh, I had been on it for a week, by the way. I'd been okay. on a raw food diet for a week and I was feeling great. And then uh, I said, well, are, are there any are there any alternative therapies available? Or And at that point, his demeanor really changed. I'm sure. I mean, I asked the guy two questions. That's it. Two questions. And that was like too much for him. Mm -hmm. You know, like I was somehow like now I was a threat to his expertise or something. So he just just totally flipped into this sort of I know everything. You don't know anything kind of demeanor and started talking down to us and basically saying, look, if you don't do this, you're going to die. Right. Right. Um, and uh, at one point during his diatribe, he said, he said, look, and you know, man, I'm not telling you this because I need your business, <laughs> which was such a weird thing for a doctor to say. A really weird thing, especially yeah. for, to a cancer patient. Yeah. And it's not like I was like, how much money are you making off of me? Right. Right. Like I didn't, he just threw it. He just blurted it out. Like he thought it would be a help. It would be persuasive or something that, and, um, but obviously it was very telling, you know, cause I hadn't right. thought at all about the cancer industry about the business side of it. And I know now the average cancer patient's worth over $300,000 in revenue and sometimes up, upwards of a million dollars or more in revenue from surgeries, hospital visits, radiation treatments, chemo treatments, uh, you know, clinic visits, uh, breast reconstruction, nipple tattoos, wigs. I mean, you know, just, it just goes on and on. Yeah. So there's a just massive, massive industry built around treating cancer patients, not necessarily curing them. And, uh, so, um, he scared me into chemo, uh, and I left, we, I walked out of his little cubicle office and I made an appointment to get a port put in, in a few weeks to start chemotherapy. And then we walked, my wife and I walked to her car and sat in her car and, and held hands and cried. And I choked out a prayer, you know, I was just so defeated and deflated and depressed. I'm sure it was just awful, you know, and cancer clinics, unfortunately, a lot of them, they're just, they're just fear factories, right? These doctors, I'm not trying to throw them all under the bus here, but it's very common for oncologists. They just use fear as a, as a way to manipulate and coerce patients into saying yes to treatment. Well, and the cancer patient is very vulnerable at that time. I mean, Absolutely. they're, they're afraid they want to live. And this is one of my frustrations is, there's a time and a place for Western medicine, but there's also so many amazing benefits with the Eastern medicine and nutrition. And I wish they would come together because 
Still in 2022, you're hearing about these oncologists that won't accept alternative therapies or nutrition. Um, Thankfully, I have heard some stories of some oncologists coming around to the idea and supporting them in their alternative, alternative treatments. But, you know, 20 years later, we're still facing the same thing. Yeah, it's changing uh, slowly for the better. Uh, and that's not because the cancer industry said, hey, you know, we could do better. No, it's, <laughs> it's not because people of that. It's are because demanding of, it. That's right. Patient demand is driving these changes. And doctors are observing their, their patients doing better, the ones that change their diet and their lifestyle and have a positive attitude and strong faith. They're, observ- they're just seeing with their own eyes the people that thrive through treatment are yeah. are approaching it in a different way and they're doing more than just the treatment right and that's my big message it isn't hey nobody do chemo right um my message is there's so much more you can do to help yourself whether you do chemotherapy or radiation or surgery or not like there's so much more you can do that can increase your odds of survival uh, or decrease your odds of recurrence same difference or and decrease your odds of ever getting cancer right so why not like why not live your life in a way that sets you up for long for longevity and uh and uh, optimal health and then you can grow old gracefully and hopefully just die in your sleep (laughs) well and i could i could ask you a lot of questions about that and i will but let's finish your story because i'm sure people are wondering okay did you do the chemo what did you do spoiler i didn't die (laughs) yeah exactly you're still here 20 years later yeah so i um I had all this pressure to do chemo, but I, I'm so thankful that I had several weeks between, you know, before it would start. And so I just went home, you know, after that really horrible day, I just went home and fired up the juicer. You know, I'm like, well, I'm, I'm going to keep doing this. I still believe this is going to help me. It's, and so it was, you know, and I just felt very alone during that time. I was so alone. No one understood what I was going through. And it was like me, Jesus, and a juicer. Well, back in two thousand, yeah, back in two thousand four, I know because I've been on a health journey myself. But mine was with suicidal depression. But back then, mm. no one uh, nutrition wasn't trendy like it is today. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. So I just kept doing that. I can't, and I kept reading and researching, and I found more information, and more encouraging testimonials of people who had healed can- advanced cancers naturally and other alternative and holistic integrative doctors who were who were telling me to do the same things I was doing. And my mom ended up having, you know, it was, this was another miracle. She had a huge library of books on natural medicine and alternative medicine. Hmm. She was not, she's not a practitioner. She'd never been sick, but she just has always loved to read and learn and just had all these books by Paul Bragg and Pavo Areola and, um, Oh, like uh, the first book ever written about rebounding. Um, and I've got a ton of her books on fasting, Herbert Shelton, you know, just wow. Linus Pauling on vitamin C. I've just had all these, you know, all the books from the from the rack at, at the little hole in the wall health food store. That's <laughs> you know? incredible. Yeah. And so and in the beginning, she was my biggest supporter because she understood she she had read she had this background and in natural health and healing. And so, um, so that was helpful, but you know, for the most part, I was still struggling and, uh, and just desperate to find more confirmation Mm -hmm. and I found it, you know, and the cool thing is that at that time I was just going from book to book. I watched some VHS tapes, Dr. Lorraine day and Dr. Richard Schultz had some of his cassette tapes. Like I was, you know, and they were all saying the same thing for cancer, raw foods, juicing, exercise, fasting, forgiveness, Hmm. just, they were all saying the same thing. And so I'm like, okay, well, you know, everywhere I turn, I'm getting the same message. message. Like, this is what you have to do uh, if you want to help yourself. So, so that's what I did. And then that day came to go start chemotherapy or go get the port. And, uh, and I just woke up that morning and I was like, I'm not doing it. Hmm. I'm just not doing it. I I don't want to do it. I'm not, I'm not going to do it. I, I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to take full responsibility for my life and my health and I'm going to live or die on my own terms. And so, and it wasn't like I, I was saying I'll never do chemo, 
but I was just saying, this is not what I want to do right now. I can do it later. Okay. But what I want to do right now is I want to overdose on nutrition. I want to change my life and I want to do everything in my power to help my body heal. That's oh. what I want to do. That's what I'm excited about and passionate about. And I have this, you know, determination and drive and a strong will to live. And I had what I call the beat cancer mindset, which I talk about in, in two of my books, my first book, Chris beat cancer, and then my devotional, which is called beat cancer daily. And the beat cancer mindset is like this. First of all, you have to believe you can heal, right? You have to believe that healing is possible. Okay. That's where it starts. You have to believe you can get well. Second thing is you have to want to get well. Mm -hmm. You have to want to live. Because it's hard work. Live, you have to, what's that? It's hard work. So you right. have to have that desire. You have to decide and ask yourself this question. Do I want to live? Yes or no? And then you answer the question for yourself. If the answer is no, that's okay. Some people, they're ready to go. It's all right. But if the answer is yes, then you need to get clear about what you have to live for, right? This is what I ask every patient, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. Do you want to live? Okay. The answer is yes. Why? Hmm. What do you have to live for? And I got very clear about what I had to live for. I had a wife who had been married for two years, dated for six. So we'd been together, together eight years. And I had two parents of which I'm the only child. And I couldn't bear the thought of them putting me in the ground. Right. That was such a painful thought to me. You know, I'm a big deal to these three people. <laughs> right. Right. Like, and so I, I just didn't want, I didn't want them to suffer that kind of pain and loss. You know, I certainly want, wouldn't want to bury my wife in her twenties. So I got very clear about that. And, and, um, and then from there, the beat cancer mindset means taking full responsibility for your health, hmm. being willing to change everything in your life, right? Not making excuses and deciding to enjoy the journey. Oh, that's amazing. Right? All of those elements. And by the way, this isn't just me. This is what I've observed in every single person I know who was healed holistically against the odds, right? We all had these same common factors in our life. So can I just say really quick, but this mindset, I think applies to a lot of healing, not just cancer, because it's the exact same with healing from depression. You have to determine your why, and you've got to take full responsibility and it's hard work. It's changing everything. So yeah, it is changing everything, right? Being willing to change everything is, is a key component. And that's the, the thing about the thing that I think some cancer patients there are a lot of them is they they have this attitude in the beginning they i have a cancer diagnosis they're like i'm gonna i'm gonna fight this i'm gonna beat it i'm gonna win you know i'm gonna be whatever i'm gonna be a survivor and that's great uh that's a great attitude to have but they think that in it, that fighting it means they have to do every treatment available right and they have to endure these harsh and brutal treatments because we've been convinced by the cancer industry using this militaristic language, right? That there's a war on cancer, that you're a warrior if you have mm -hmm. cancer and you're a fighter. And if that's true, well, then you, you should expect to suffer because there's suffering in war mm -hmm. and in the cancer battle. You with me? Yep. And so patients that get in this mindset, they're programmed to think, I'm a warrior, it's a battle, I've got to fight. And fighting means suffering. Yeah. That's and that's how they use this psychological manipulation to convince patients they have to, to suffer. It's like, you're not fighting, you're being poisoned. That's not fighting. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's not. <laughs> okay. It, like, it's easy to sit in a comfortable chair and let someone poison you. Interesting. That's tough talk. Yeah. Right. I get it. It's tough talk, but I'm just telling you the truth. You know what's hard? Changing your life. Right. That's Ch hard. Changing Sitting there being injected with something is easy. I'm not saying it's pleasant, but it's easy. But it's hard to look in the mirror and face your faults and your fears and your failures, right? And be honest about who you are and the mistakes you've made. And then just make a decision to change the way you think and the way you act and the way you live your life each day. That's hard. Yeah, it is hard. And 
most patients don't want to do it, right? Because that's just people. Right. People don't just like say. to change. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's healing, you know, cancer or heart disease or autoimmune, autoimmune or depression, right? It's, you're right. It's the same attitude and determination that you have to just be willing to say, you know what? Maybe this is my fault, right? Maybe this is my fault and I'm okay with it being my fault because if it's my fault then I can change. I can yep. help myself, right? I can yep. dig myself out of this hole <laughs> exactly, or climb out or whatever, right? Yeah. Like I can't stop. I can't just keep blaming everyone else for the problems in my life right. or just chalking it up to bad luck or something, right? I have right. to look and say, hey, this is my, one of my favorite expressions is it's a, it's a variation, an adaptation of a common expression, which is a cliche, which is everything happens for a reason. Mm. Like, I believe that, but yeah, most of the time, the reason is you. Yeah, true. Right. Most of the time, the things that happen to you in your life, most of the time it's because of this, the decisions you made. Yep. So that's just taking full responsibility for your health. And so you know, I didn't realize this all up, up front, right? It was progressive realization, progressive revelation as I was working through changing my life in order to help myself heal. And then I've interviewed, you know, dozens and dozens of cancer patients and doctors and practitioners on crispbeatcancer.com, on the podcast, on my YouTube channel. And I just keep hearing the same things over and over from, from these people, right? We're all sharing the same message. And which is a hopeful message that you can heal right? Right. if you're willing to change yep. your life. The body is miraculous. It is. So, and healing is possible. And you have to realize like, what is making me sick? You have right. to become an investigator and your own little private detective and figure out what in my life is making me sick. Is it my job, right? Is it my relationships? Is it the food I'm eating? Is it my bad habits? Maybe it's all of those things. You know, yeah. the number one, there's so much talk right now, like Joe Biden's cancer moonshot and all this kind of stuff. So much talk about finding a cure and more research, cancer research money. And it's such, it's so frustrating to me because we know what causes cancer. It's not a mystery at all. And they're trying to basically pump a bunch of money into the drug industry to produce drugs that they can make billions of dollars off of. Right. Instead of punching. Preventing huh? it rather than preventing it. Instead of prevention, instead of pumping a bunch of money into educating the public or to changing laws and passing regulations and things that literally remove cancer causers from our world, you know, mm -hmm. environmental pollution is a huge problem. And there's tons of toxic chemical pollutants that are giving people cancer, like, and they're known. Right. Um, the number one cause of cancer is cigarettes. Yep. It's the number one cause, smoking. The good thing is, is smoking is declining. Yeah. And so less people are getting smoking related cancers, lung cancers and other cancers, because it's just fallen out of fashion. Yeah. So that's great. Um, and when you hear the news reports saying like uh, cancer rates are, are falling year after year, you know, since 1991. Yeah, that was like kind of the peak smoking year. Uh, and since then, it's just less and less people have, have uh, are smoking. So that's great. But the number two cause, which is not going down, it's going up. The number two cause of cancer is obesity. It's and the second leading cause of cancer. And unfortunately, not only is it not being talked about, it's now become, now you're, you're a fat shamer. Yep. I if was you, just going to say, you can If you talk, talk about, about the unhealthiness of uh, being overweight or obese, all of a sudden you're judging people now. If you're just explaining them clinically or medically, yep. right, biologically, why being overweight or obese is bad for your health. And I can explain the cancer part of it for people that are like, why, how is obesity related to cancer? When you're overweight or obese, you're, um, there's a few things happening at once. Number one, it's a burden to the whole system, right? Okay. All that excess body fat, it's a burden to the entire system, but specifically body fat cells produce hormones like estrogen. And so for women having all this excess estrogen circulating in their bodies fuels cancer growth. Estrogen fuels cancer. Uh, number two, fat cells produce a lot of inflammatory molecules that circulate into your blood and into your body and promote inflammation. Inflammation is a precancerous state in tissue, right? The other thing that happens is fat cells release fatty acids into your bloodstream that circulate 
and your immune cells uh, gobble them up, right? They take them up, absorb them. And the problem is they don't break them down. They just become bloated with fatty acids. And so what researchers at Vanderbilt found, discovered just a couple of years ago, was that immune cells in an obese environment are also obese. Hmm. So think about your immune cells are your army. They're supposed to fight off pathogens, viruses, bacteria, cancer cells, right? They're supposed to identify and eliminate those cells. Well, guess what? If your army is a bunch of obese soldiers, they're not going to be very good at their job, right? And they are. They're slow and sluggish, these obese immune cells. And then the fourth component of being obese is immunosuppression, Right, so that and that's related to to the the function of your immune system is uh, is depressed, it's hindered, hampered, whatever you want to call it, and so you have inflammation and a suppressed immune system and hormones driving cancer growth all at the same time when you're overweight or obese. So that is how obesity drives cancer. Oh, you just did a great job explaining that, and I bet most Americans don't even recognize or know those four simple things no no they they wouldn't right because it's not being talked about on the news or really anywhere well and can we also add sugar to that to make it a list of five things uh well you know i think sugar's gotten a bad rap that's what i'm saying oh you think it's gotten a bad rap yeah you don't think it contributes to cancer like we thought well in isolation uh, so what's, what's interesting is for many years, there was this idea, you know, that was re- been repeated a million times, sugar feeds cancer. And the reason they say that is because they use glucose as a tracer in PET scans. Right. And cancer cells have more insulin receptors than normal cells, and they uptake sugar faster than normal cells because they have um, altered metabolism. And so they thought, yeah, well, the cancer cells light up when you give the patients glucose with a radioactive tracer. So obviously the sugar's feeding the cancer cells. Well, recent research has actually found that inside the tumor environment, there's a lot of different types of cells and there are immune cells in there. Mm -hmm. And what they found recently, and this is, this is a pretty big revelation is inside the tumor, the cells that are sucking up the sugar are immune cells. It's Mm -hmm. not the cancer cells. Oh, the cancer cells in the tumor actually prefer protein, oh, glutamine, yeah. and even fatty acids. Oh, interesting. So pr- protein and fat are driving cancer growth. It's not the sugar. And unfortunately, because people are afraid of sugar, they're not eating fruit. Right. And they're not even e- eating like these wonderful starchy carbohydrates like potatoes and uh, uh, brown, black, red rice and legumes. Uh, so those are the healthiest foods out there. And not to mention, of course, leafy green vegetables, but, but yeah, there's just been this sugar fear. Now, white processed takeable sugar is not doing anything for you, right? right. And corn syrup, no, it's not, those are not good. Well, it's foods. adding to the obesity. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's really more of just the overall caloric intake, right? We, we live in a rich country. There's, you know, fast food everywhere. We have giant supermarkets, right? It's so easy to get food and food is cheap. It's made in giant factories and it is very high in calories. So it's very high in sugar, salt, fat, oils, protein, and it's very low in uh, fiber and vitamins, minerals, enzymes, antioxidants, and phytochemicals, phytonutrients from plants. So, you know, we're suffering, like I said earlier in the interview, we're suffering from so many chronic diseases that are diseases of affluence because we have this unlimited food supply and it's unlimited fast food, junk food, processed food. So it really, I just am, I I don't blame sugar, right? I blame just, we're just eating too much food. (laughs) You know, we are overeating everything. And um, when we, when, when folks get my book or they join our square one um, healing community, we put them on a diet that's all plant food. And there's no restriction on fruit or vegetables. They can eat as much as they want. They don't have to be hungry ever. And they drink fresh vegetable juices all day, every day, which is what I did. So they're, they're consuming a ton of sugar, but mm. it's natural sugar. Right. And it's in a whole food matrix. So it's, yeah, the sugar in, let's say, carrot juice. Well, it tastes good. So you get some pleasure from, from the taste. It gives energy to every cell in your body because every cell in your body likes sugar. 
right? They run on sugar. Uh, even, even animal protein is broken down into glucose to feed your cells. So, um, so that sugar is good, but then you're also getting the vitamins, the minerals, the enzymes, the antioxidants, right. and these anti-cancer compounds that are so rich in fruits and vegetables. You know, before I was diagnosed, I was eating one to two servings of fruits and vegetables per day. Like most Americans. I, that's the average American. Well, one to two servings. And do French fries count? Is that, right. is that one of the servings? Well, so, and when I battled my depression, I finally found a doctor that would help me. And the doctor was like, how many fruits and vegetables do you eat? And I was like, mm, I don't even know if I have the last few days because yeah. I didn't grow up in a healthy home or knowing any of this. So most Americans, you know. Yeah, it's like, well, I had a banana last week. Right. Yeah. So I went from one to two servings per day to eating between 15 and 20 servings of fruits and vegetables every single day. Wow. Every day, every day, every day. And when you eat that way, you get the snowball effect, right? There is a compounding nutrient density effect in your body where you're flooding your blood and your cells and your tissues with all of these incredible nutrients from the plant kingdom, right. fruits and vegetables. You're not putting anything in there that's uh, harmful, like excess protein or or cholesterol or fat or um, you know high concentrations of amino acids uh, like methionine, so uh, or glutamine or TMAO or iron. All of these problematic compounds that, that that are not good for you when you consume too much of them in animal food or all the hormones in dairy. So you're doing two things at once, right? You're not eating all the junk and the processed food chemicals and the refined stuff. And you're flooding your body with all this really wonderful stuff. It's just really great things happen <laughs> when you decide to eat this way. And right. it doesn't take long. Just within a couple of weeks, people really start to notice. And even blood work improves rapidly. So that's cool. That's exciting to see that. Um, so I want to know, I want you to tell the listeners what happened back in your story when you were battling the cancer, you started eating this way and juicing and having all these fruits and vegetables. Did your oncologist finally see the results and was like, oh, wow, you've shrunk the tumor or you've gotten rid of your cancer? I mean, what was the rest of the story? Thank you for asking that because um, there's another lesson in here. And the first lesson is if you don't like the doctor, find another doctor. Yes. 100%. I never went back to the, the guy that was rude to us and intimidated Good for me. you. I never saw him again, but I found a naturopathic doctor and he connected me with an integrative oncologist, a medical doctor who is now deceased because he was in his seventies back in 2004. And he was a, a, he was a prince of a man. He was just an incredible man who totally supported what I was doing. And he wasn't an expert in nutrition or anything like that, but he had spent an, an entire career as a conventional surgical oncologist, retired, didn't like being retired, started practicing again, but he just came at it with a different perspective. And he, and he started his, his new practice focus. He was trying to uh, help his patients survive with non-toxic therapies and was going to to China and studying Eastern medicine and like doing all this stuff in his seventies. I mean, it was absolutely remarkable. So I, I, he did IV vitamin C treatments for me mm -hmm. and he ordered my blood work every month and he ordered my CT scans every six months. So we had this really wonderful relationship. And, uh, and that was, that was my doctor for the, for the, basically the first almost five years. Uh, and then he ended up retiring again. Um, so it's just really important. There's so many, there are good doctors out there, there but are. you have to beat the bushes a little bit. Yeah. And it, and the way to break in and the way to find them, I mean, yeah, you can try Google and maybe something will come up, but usually it's to get con connected with the local natural health community, right? So go find a naturopath, go find the actu acupuncturist, right? Go, you know, talk to your chiropractor, like get into that circle because they all know, right? They all know the other practitioners in your area that are doing things that are holistic and integrative. And so that word of mouth really is the way that you, is the best way to find the best people. It is. You know, yep. In your area to help you. And it took me two years to find a doctor that would help me heal from depression. So, and I tell people all the time, if you don't like your doctor, tell them thank you for their time and move on.
Yep. So it's true. There's there's a lot of good doctors out there, but guess what? There's a lot of bad doctors too. Right. Like we have put doctors on this pedestal like they're some kind of angel or something, right? Or the saint. And they're not. There's just as many bad doctors as there are bad plumbers. They all have their own specialty. And so sometimes that specialty doesn't fit you. Yeah. Doctors are humans, just like everybody else. And guess what? Humans are selfish. They're greedy. They uh, sometimes are ill-prepared. They they have drug and alcohol addiction problems, right? They have family problems. They were up too late the night before. I mean, you know, there's the whole host of things that affect any profession also affect medicine. And so, yeah, we just, we just give doctors way too much credit. I think people are learning that and people are educating themselves as well, because I know I've got a really close friend battling cancer. I've got an uncle battling cancer. They empower themselves with knowledge and research like crazy and take that to their doctors. And sometimes it's research that doctors haven't even heard of yet, you know? So, and that, that is that is the inherent problem is that before everybody thinks I'm anti-doctor, I'm not. I have dear friends that are doctors, lots of them. And, um, and my favorite doctors are the ones that are, you know, that use diet and lifestyle medicine to help help their patients, right? They, right. they help their patients change their diets and they help them get, yeah. get on an exercise plan. And they help them get off of medication. They don't pile them on, right? They don't yeah. pile the prescriptions on to the person. They, they look at them, their situation and say, okay, well, let's, let's work to get you off of these things. We can do it with diet and lifestyle and stress reduction. So there's a, there's a lot of good doctors like that. The Plantrition Project is a great resource for doctors that are holistic and, uh, and also plant-based. Um, and that, that organization is just growing and growing and growing. It's a, it's a global organization of medical professionals. So that's one resource for folks. But um, the other thing I want to just point out there is that when doctors are trapped in a system that has not trained them or prepared them to help people get well, right? Right. The, the medical system funnels money back to the pharmaceutical industry. That's the biggest beneficiary for our current medical model, right? Because pharmaceutical drugs are at the, at the heart of quote medicine, right? Medicine. They call drugs medicine. They don't call food medicine. Only drugs are allowed to be called medicine. Uh, so that's propaganda, you know, strategy number one, right? That only patented pharmaceuticals are medicine. Of course, they're still medicine if they're off patent. But once a drug's off patent, the drug companies are quickly, uh, they stop marketing. I mean, this is what's crazy. I've, when a drug is patented, they're running ads every day. Mm-hmm. They're, they're sending pharmaceutical reps to doctors every day to convince them to prescribe this drug. As soon as that patent stops, the marketing stops. Right. And they're, and they're marketing the another drug to replace it that's patented, right? So they don't actually care about which drug works better. They only care about which drug they have an exclusive patent on that makes them the most money. So it's never, the healthcare industry is doesn't care about your health. That's why they you have to find care. a good doctor, one that will right. care about your health. A good doctor may care about your health, but the industry he's a part of doesn't. And so You've got a lot of doctors that are trained and trapped in a system that pays them really well, and it doesn't matter what the results are for the patient, right? And that's the key. The cancer industry is the perfect example because, you know, patients are, are poisoned and cut and burned and, and they suffer tremendously and most of them don't survive. And doctors are paid really well and they're just, they're not allowed, they don't have the freedom to actually practice medicine. They don't have the freedom to use nutrition and lifestyle intervention interventions with their patients or they risk losing their license. Right. And so that I so I'm just saying all that to say I really sympathize with doctors because it takes almost 20 years to establish yourself as a doctor and by that time you're just locked in. It's like you're going to change careers now after you invested 20 years of your life and all this money and on education and training and all this kind of stuff. And then you realize they never taught me anything about nutrition right. <laughs> this whole time, right. 20 it's years. A- and I don't even, you know, I'm unhealthy and I'm overweight and I'm smoking and drinking and like taking prescription medication and I'm a doctor. <laughs> it's a broken system. That's for sure. But I, I do feel like there is a little bit of change maybe coming or some doctors are trying to see other sites, but tell yeah. my listeners, cause we stopped in your story again. So after juicing and you got this oncologist that you loved, did you see better blood results? Yes. 
Absolutely. So my my entire goal was to prevent this recurrence that I was told was uh, basically inevitable after surgery because surgery doesn't cure stage three colon cancer. I mean, it's, it's cancer cells are already spreading around your body. Your immune system's weak. Surgery can actually cause metastasis and suppress your immune system. It just it sets you up for a for a recurrence. So um, yeah, the goal was like to not get more cancer, right. <laughs> to, to get, as Dr. Thomas Lodi says, to stop making cancer, right? That was the goal. I need to change my internal environment so that my body stops making it. Because that's the, that's the deal. Like cancer, it didn't crawl into your ear. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. These are your own cells. Right. And you weren't- It's your own body. It's your own DNA. And there's some mutiny aboard the ship, right? And so- so I did. I, I did not have a recurrence. I kept, you know, working with a naturopath, chiropractor, acupuncture, integrative oncologist. I had a little team assembled, uh, helping me monitor and and helping me do do and everything I could find and afford to help myself. And I had a I had a very simple sort of um, criteria. It was like, will this uh, possibly help me? If the answer is yes. And if there's no risk of harm, then I will do it. Okay. Right? So that was my approach. I don't care if it's an herb, is it an IV treatment, whatever. Like if there's no risk of harm and there's a potential benefit, I'll do it, right? I'll do it. So it was tons of supplements, tons of herbs, tons of nutrition. Um, and I, all of a sudden I was, five years had gone by and still no cancer. That's and incredible. that's when my oncologist said, hey, I think you're out of the woods, you know? Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And the good thing is the fear, you know, really starts to subside. You know, it's really scary in the beginning, but as you start to take control of your life, right, and become empowered, the fear starts to subside. And then as time goes by, it definitely diminishes, right? You get to the one year mark, no cancer. Okay, that's great. That's a milestone. Then you get to two years, that's a milestone, right? So every year is is another milestone and and the fear and anxiety and stuff subside. Uh, quite a bit, you know, over time. But in the short term, I want to, I know we're probably getting close on time here, but I want to make sure I share this with your listeners. You know, the biggest thing that I had to do is I had to learn how to give my fears and worries to God. Mm. I had to surrender my fear, right? Because I knew I couldn't live in a constant state of fear. So every time the fear would creep in, which was every day in the beginning, every time you turn on the news or a TV show or a movie, somebody's got cancer. <laughs> you know what right. I mean? It's, true. it's like, and you were like, and you had forgotten that you had it, right? Like you're going through your day and you're busy and you're not thinking about cancer. And then something reminds you and it's like, ugh, you know, it's just the worst feeling to be reminded that you're you know, sure. potentially dying. But anytime I would get those really scary reminders of cancer, I would just stop in that moment and say, okay, God, I trust you. I'm, I'm not going to be afraid. I'm just giving you my fear, you know, laying it at the feet of Jesus, laying it down. That's and, incredible. You know, so I just had to keep doing that over and over and over every day trusting him and just making a choice to not live in fear and that's that's applicable to the world today it's right so, we've been injected yeah. with so much fear in the last two years and people have become crippled and paralyzed and you know the cancer experience taught me how to deal with fear and so i i have never been afraid right since 2020 there's there's never been a time i was worried or concerned or afraid and because i just knew because I had this these tools, right? Right. To give my fear to God and just say, I trust you. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to live my life in terror and fear right. and hide in my home. Same. Right. I'm going to live a life with peace and joy and, you know, and just trust God with my future. And you know what's crazy is these emotions of fear and anger, whatever, frustration, not forgiving people, like you said earlier on the show, they actually can play a role in cancer, correct? Absolutely. When you're holding on to fear, let's just do the, the, the larger umbrella term is stress. Mm -hmm. So under the stress umbrella, stress suppresses your immune system. Okay. And promotes inflammation because stress hormones like adrenaline and cortisol do that when you're stressed, they're suppressing your immune system, promoting inflammation. So under the stress umbrella are all your negative emotions that make you stressed. So the fear, the worry, the anxiety, that's that's future based, right? Yep. Uh, the present, which is like jealousy, prejudice, envy, 
you know, insecurity. Mm -hmm. Those are negative emotions that you, in your present that are producing stress. And then from your past, you've got bitterness, mm -hmm. anger, uh, resentment, unforgiveness. And so many of us are bouncing back and forth between being angry at someone from our past, being jealous of someone in our present and being worried about something in the future. So right? true. So, true. so it's, so it's, you're just constantly in a state of stress, right? Yeah. Right. Constantly. And so when you're in a state of stress, your body becomes vulnerable to chronic disease and cancer. And it's not like, oh, one stressful week's going to give you cancer. Like that's not the way it works. It's the months and months and years and years of these cr of chronic stress that degrades your health. And on top of that, what we, how the, the other piece of this puzzle, by the way, is how are you coping with right. the stress? Because uh, most of us are self-medicating when we are in, in a stressful situation or have stressful thoughts and emotions and feelings. And so we self-medicate with cigarettes, those cause cancer, with alcohol, that causes cancer, with overeating, obesity causes cancer, right? Or with other really unhealthy things that compound your stress and your problems like gambling, right? right. Or spending money you don't have or pornography addiction, like so many of these ways, video game addiction, social media addiction, right? There's so many of these ways that we, we co we're trying to cope with our own stress that just compound our problems, right? Rather, In the short term, they give us some relief. I didn't even mention drugs, right? right. Prescription drugs, uh, illegal drugs. Uh, so they give us some short-term relief, but they actually extend our problems further into the future. So returning to that rather than the forgiveness, the peace, the hope, things like yeah, that. Yeah, and and so I, and I talk about this in great deal in my first two books. The, the I have a cookbook too, which is all plant based, and it just focuses on the food. But talking about identifying and eliminating stress in your life is so critical to health and healing, like figuring out what is causing you stress and addressing it head on, right? And either getting away from that stress or solving that stress producing problem, right? Either way, like the, there's so many little stressful things in your life that you can eliminate. Some things you can eliminate right away. Some things take a little time, but if you, if you become active and focus your attention on solving your problems and changing the way you think and forgiving every person who's ever hurt you, which I have done. And I continue to do as people are constantly mean to me on the internet. <laughs> I'm sure I can only right? imagine. Or somebody cuts yeah. me off in traffic or gives me the yeah. fingers, I think, right? Like I've become very quick to forgive. I just realized like there's, it's not worth holding on to anger or bitterness or resentment. It's not worth ruining my day. Like I've just got to be quick to forgive the people who hurt me. And um, that will free you from the prison of pain. Because yeah. at the end of the day, so many of us are holding on to these, to this pain from our past. Yep. And that pain is keeping you unhappy. It's keeping you miserable, right? It's causing depression and anxiety. And, and it's causing you to also self-medicate in unhealthy ways. And so you have this vicious downward spiral, right? The vicious right. cycle. But here's the best thing. You can break that cycle. You can start going the uh, this way. This is the virtuous cycle, right? The virtuous cycle is where your health spirals up. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Okay, I know we are running short on time, but I just have a few last questions that I'm sure the listeners are wondering. Do you still eat today like you did when you were battling cancer? So the anti-cancer diet was the most hardcore diet, and I don't eat all raw today. And I don't, I don't encourage anyone to eat a raw food diet forever, right? It's a, it's a healing diet for a season in life. I think we should eat a lot of raw fruits and vegetables generally in our diet, which I do, but I'm not 100% raw. But I do eat a plant-based diet. Okay. So I just focus on eating whole fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, herbs and spices, like whole grains, legumes, like all the wonderful food that God has made for us. I eat it raw and cooked. So breakfast might be oatmeal with flaxseed, hemp seed, chia seed, blueberries, lunch, uh, big fruit smoothie with blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, strawberries, bananas, dates, spinach, walnuts, almonds, kale. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then dinner will be some type of cooked meal typically it could be a giant salad or it could be a cooked meal like uh like black beans sweet potatoes lentils collard greens 
I've got a bunch of recipes in my cookbook, Beat Cancer Kitchen, that are like super easy, delicious, loaded with herbs and spices. I mean, they're just so savory and tasty. Uh, like you won't miss eating meat. You just won't miss it. If you start eating, just start with some of the recipes in Beat Cancer Kitchen. You'll realize like how delicious and satisfying whole plant foods are. If you just, you know, just use the right seasonings and spices, right. it just makes everything amazing. So yeah, that's, you know, that's the way I eat now. It, uh, it's, I've been doing this, you know, all my, my 19 year cancer anniversary is in December. So that's coming up incredible. on 19 years, I have a senior in high school. <laughs> wow. That's incredible. <laughs> who was so born, amazing. He was born. She was born the year I was diagnosed. Wow. Yeah. You've got and to have so, a big celebration for the 20th. I know. I know. I've thought about it too. Where well, I'm, I need to, I know I need to strategize a little bit and, and try to figure out what should we do for my 20 year cancer anniversary, try, try to do something big. Cause yeah, it's, it's about a year and just a little over a year away. Well, I feel like God had a plan for you because you have definitely helped so many people through your struggle. And with that, I want to ask you this because I know I'll have um, listeners that are battling cancer, just got a cancer diagnosis. So what is your advice? Because I know people approach you all the time that are just diagnosed with cancer. What is your beginning typical advice for them? Well, a lot of the advice for them is I've already said, <laughs> you right. know what I mean, uh, in this interview. But the, the shortest version is you have to take responsibility for your health, right? If you want, to, if you really want to live, get you have to get clear about why you want to live, and you have to be willing to change your life. And there are so many interviews of people who have healed cancer, and they're on ChrisBeatCancer.com, and you can type in breast cancer or ovarian or lymphoma or whatever, right. and watch these interviews with people who've healed, because you will see the more interviews you watch the more common threads you will see, right? You'll yep. start to understand, oh, there's definitely a way, right, that to heal. And then you'll hopefully have that revelation that I just need to, I need to do what these other people did, right, to help myself. And whether you do chemo or surgery or radiation or whatever, I mean, that's your personal decision. I do have a great a resource that's free called 20 Questions for Your Oncologist. It's a download on crispycancer.com. It's, there's a link to it on every page of the website. So download that guide, go through it, and then use those questions. Because if you don't ask the right questions, you will be led down a path, of basically down this mysterious path of the unknown where you have no idea what's gonna happen to you. And you don't wanna be in that situation. You wanna be fully informed so you can make the best decision for you about treatment. And so that just means asking the right questions. So I hope folks will get that. Of course, I've got my book, Chris Beat Cancer, a devotional called Beat Cancer Daily, and then a whole food plant-based cookbook called Beat Cancer Kitchen. And those are all on Amazon and most bookstores carry them. Um, and then we have a private community, a coaching community called Square One. And there's a link to that on chrisbeatcancer.com too at the top, it's the coaching link. And um, if, you know, that's for people that are really serious and they want to be a part of our private support community and they want coaching and they just really want to change their life. And it's a 10 part video coaching program. You have a lot of resources for those yeah. that are battling cancer. I do yes. know that. There's so much you can do to help yourself. Like that is my biggest message, right? There's so much you can do. You're not a victim. You're not unlucky, right? You've got to change your life, and there's so much you can do to help yourself heal, survive, and thrive if you're just willing to change your daily routine, right? It just boils down to simple changes to your daily routine without, because I know it all right. sounds overwhelming. Like I'm talking about, oh, he's about all this stuff. Uh, yeah, but it really just, it's just changing what you eat three times a day, right? <laughs> you know? It's just changing the way you think about your your life and your situation. It's maybe changing some relationships. It's extra starting to exercise because exercise improves survival. So it's like, these are really simple things. They're, they're really simple. And I've been, I've always been very conscientious about not trying to, well, first of all, just like pedal and hawk a bunch of like miracle cure stuff, right? Like that's not what I'm interested in doing. It's like trying to sell people a bunch of gadgets and gizmos and devices and lotions and potions, right? right. <laughs> that, that, you know, to like cure your cancer, like that stuff doesn't work. You know, sure, you can add that stuff, but it's the fundamental things that you have to do to help yourself, which is what you're eating, the way you're thinking, 
exercising and forgiving the people who've hurt you. I mean, these are the most powerful things you can do for yourself. Right. And most of them really don't cost anything. You just have to be willing to do it. Well, and I love that you are never like, don't work with a practitioner, only do these things. You are like work with a practitioner, but implement these things in your life, empower yourself to do the things that you can do at home while you work with whatever practitioner you choose and whatever therapies and treatments you choose. Absolutely. And the biggest lie is that nothing you do will help you, right? And I'm that's what I'm trying to fight and, and combat against is this disempowering lie that patients right. are like, my doctor said I can eat whatever I want, you know, this kind right. of thing. It's like, no, <laughs> like not if you want to get well, right? <laughs> like, you know, exactly. so uh, anyway, well, there, is, there is a path and a mile, here's my last analogy. Healing is like climbing Mount Everest, right? It's, it's a journey, right? Yep. It's, it's difficult. It takes time. And there's two ways you can climb Mount Everest. You could jump in a plane and fly to Nepal tomorrow and just like try and you'll probably fail and die, right? right. Or you can prepare. You can read and research and prepare yourself, and then you can travel to Nepal and hire a guide, a Sherpa, to take you up. And you can go up the path that everyone else takes to get to the top, right? Right. Like, let's let's use the known path of success instead of trying to, like, forge our own path up the mountain, right? Because it's difficult enough. And... When again, when you if you read my book or join our program or watch all the interviews I've done, you'll see the path, right? right? You'll and and so we just encourage folks like just do what every other survivor who has healed against the odds did. Just do what they did. Like, don't question it. You know, don't don't second guess yourself. Like, just follow the path of people who've done it. That yeah. and that'll put you and you know and you you learn as you go, right? But that'll right. that's the path of success. I love that analogy. That's a great analogy. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you taking the time. I I believe you were given this trial to help others, that God knew that you would research more and learn more and go help others. And you have helped thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And so thank you for everything that you do. I always close my podcast with asking my guests what they have found to be the best ingredient in life. So I'm really curious to see what you'll say. Well, okay, before I answer that, I'm, I'm uh, trying to buy myself some time to have a good answer, but <laughs> <laughs> thanks for having me on. It's well, been really fun to talk to you. I'm so glad you're doing this podcast and I just am so thankful to um, just to be able to share my story and what I've learned and hopefully give, some, give people some hope, right. right? At the end of the day, I mean, everything that I do is, is to create that little spark of hope. And you right. do. Because I know if someone can get that little spark of hope, then that's the first step in them starting to change their life, right? And right. so anyway, that's why I do what I do. But I guess that's a good answer for your question about ingredients, right? Yep. Hope, Yep. right, yep. is such a powerful thing. And I know it's sort of misunderstood. Like, I mean, you know, there's a president who ran his whole campaign on hope. Like, what? hope for what? You know, <laughs> like the hope you have needs to be specific, right? It, and I talk about this actually in my devotional on one of the pages, but there has to be a specific outcome tied to, to your hope, right? And the way you build up your hope is by learning from people who've healed, Yeah. right? That's where my hope came from. First, it was just, it was a strong desire to get well, right? I believed and I hoped it was possible. But then as I learned, I realized and I became to know that it was possible, right? And so then you know, my hope <laughs> increased, it strengthened, because I was like, people have healed, I can heal too, yeah. right? And there's a path. So all that I think ties together. Um, it it does. The It starts with the belief and the hope, but then you have to take some action, right? right? To grow your faith, right? And your hope, which are kind of interchangeable in a lot of ways, hope and faith, you know, come together. My, I'll end with one other little thing, which is a conversation I had with a, a with an integrative cancer doctor recently, and we were kind of having a, like a little bit of a friendly debate because he said, I was saying, well, you have to, you know, you really have to believe that healing is possible. This is really important. And he said, well, he said, you know, patients that do well, they know they can get well. Hmm. And I, and so 
there's a little bit of a difference of opinion there. And he said, well, they don't just believe they can get well, they know they can get well. And I said, well, you know, in the beginning of the cancer journey, you don't know you can get well. Right. You, know? you have to believe. You, you hope you hope you hope you, you hope you can, right? That's where mm -hmm. it starts with this. I hope I I I think it's possible. I hope it's possible. Is it possible? Right? These are the, the thoughts. And as I started to read and research and discover other people who had healed, then I increased my knowledge. So I went from believing it was possible to knowing it was possible. Yep. And that ha and, and that so, is true with any illness because uh it is the exact same for depression lost my hope, then hit rock bottom, had hope that there was healing of some sort, and now knowing that there is healing. So like I said, works in lots of different illnesses. But again, thank you so much, Chris, for being here today. I really appreciate you taking the time. And those that are listening, go check out all of his resources because it is a plethora of information to help you if you are battling cancer, if you know someone battling cancer. So um, go find those. And again, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It was really fun. Thank you so much for listening. Remember to subscribe to the Just Ingredients podcast to learn more about your health and good ingredients to life. Plus get daily tips at just.ingredients on Instagram.